Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, so, obviously, you are a uh, country performer. Yeah. Would you say? Uh, How would you pigeonhole yourself as a performer? Right now, it was, uh, it was a full band, definitely like honky tonk mm -hmm. kind of country, for sure. However, I see myself just as a songwriter. I, you know, have written different types of songs and in the past have played in different bands, but right now, the band that I have and what we go for is honky tonk, country, and some western. But I also write a lot of like country folk or just folk songs as well. And uh, like to always, you know, next album and stuff, I always like, have a new vision. And I'm just, I see myself at the end of the day of more just a songwriter. Songwriter? Do you have like books and books of songs that you haven't written or just for? ideas or is it more like uh, yeah well at, some people are like one at a time yeah there's very few and then some people have like 400 songs and they're all these like scraps of ideas that you know what, what are, you, are you both or what do you you know what's your yeah I've, I've definitely more one at a time kind of guy that's happened for years uh, as time has gone on and uh evolved more as a songwriter I definitely get different ideas and hate to say it but I like put them in my notepad and my iPhone mm -hmm. <laughs> like write down ideas and then like even lyric or just concept ideas and like themes and stuff to go with a song idea I already have written down uh, but typically it's one song at a time and however long that takes that's where I try to keep my mind if it takes one night if it takes three months like just trying to focus on that to like get it done, dot the eyes, and move on to the next. How do you determine if a song's like good enough to go into the studio and record? I try to keep it that if I'm gonna write a song, it's going on the next. Okay. Record. Yeah. Um, so you're not wasting any time. Yeah. Like, you know. Uh, in the past, you know, early days of songwriting, I definitely didn't record all the songs or. There's tons of songs now that I will never play live again, that are just like it's on the on the old old album or whatever, and that's that's the end of that. And I will probably have all, always will have songs like that, but I like to think that yeah, if I'm writing a song, I'm gonna make sure it's worthy to record it and keep it. Right. So, so you're just like some like comedians, they'll go out and they'll just test material, test right. it, and you don't do that really. Do you test them on your friends, or you just know when you know right. you know it's good. So you, right. Uh, I definitely have certain friends that I show my stuff to. Temperature gauge. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, you know, you get. I was talking to somebody the other day of some songs that I think are my weakest ones on like an album, and then people come up to me and say that's their favorite one. And I'm like, really? We almost, right. we almost took that one off the album. Uh, you're like, right. They, I, kind of seems to be a theme um, so in that case it's cool people like different things you know it's a live band I try to keep things more up tempo but I really love writing you know more mellow melancholy songs um, so yeah I was just always if this is worth my time to write I'm gonna at least give the time of day to play live a few times or yeah also put on the record cool you've uh probably traveled more than most people I know. Like, most people from St. Louis kind of stick around here uh -huh. for whatever reason, but I would say you've traveled, I mean, you've traveled even out of country uh -huh. and played your tunes. What has that done for you in terms of your musicality, and has it been frustrating, uh, or has it been good, or probably both, or what can you speak of sort of the road, or the right. open road? Uh... I mean, definitely good in the sense of, I mean, I need the stories, <laughs> you know, uh, and I need the, you need the shitty shows and the being ignored again and again and again, mm -hmm. so that when two people listen to your song, when you're playing live, whether it's on the street corner or on a bar stool, and two people, like, get it, like, mm -hmm. it feels even better, um, you know, it helps you evolve, and, um, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of hard times. I was trying to be a busker for uh, almost two years, and 
I just realized I like singing my songs more, and my songs at the time were a little too mellow for flair on the street. And on those buskers, you need to have some really good, catchy thing that within 30 seconds grabs their attention, makes their day, and makes them want to empty their pockets. Mm -hmm. And then they go on. But a lot of times my stuff, you know, it's a little more dry. You know, it's not, uh, I don't know, it's not filled with animation all the time. Uh, so, yeah, it's been a learning experience. And I just, yeah, I like to travel. I've always got the bug. I've been back for a while now, working on this new record. And I've just been saying to, like, every other person I do, like, oh, I need to get back on the road, man. <laughs> yeah, well, some I mean, some people they get off the road and they hate it. There's some people out there and they love it. Uh -huh. I think it's a combination of like four dollar gasoline, going to like shitty shows, uh -huh. and then I think some people think that they can just market themselves from their computer. Right. I think some can. It's almost like that busting mentality. Like if you have that really flareful YouTube video, you don't right. even need to leave your house. Right. But I think it's more probably a situational thing individuals and the type of music you play so. and yourself I think some people they do it forever and then they're just like ah, it's not worth it anymore and right you know I can make more money stay in put and gain more fans stay in put so why hit the road right of thing. but I think sort of the way music is headed has sort of changed people's ideas in that sense of what to do next how do you approach the sort of almost like the free music syndrome of the modern listener. Uh -huh. I mean, do you really care? Or are you just like, I'm making records and yeah. the hell with everything else sort of thing? And You're asking for like, as far as like free music that people are like ripping off the internet? Yeah, I mean, what, what do you, you know, how do you sort of think about that as an artist and how does that affect your art? Or right. do you just don't care? I mean, you know, I mean, we grew up you know, I remember when I downloaded Napster, you know, in, like, middle school, and, like, how that, like, changed my world, and how that, and downloading music for years, and, I mean, I don't, I don't really do that anymore, more out of, like, laziness, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, exposed me to so much more, and found more roots music, underground music, as opposed to what was on the radio, um, so I've kind of like, I mean, as a musician and artist, that was always there before I really started mm -hmm. putting music out there. So I'm, 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 as far as my digital stuff, I'm kind of like, you know, people want to buy it on iTunes, that's cool, but like, I think Spotify is a pretty cool thing. Sure, I mean, I'd like <laughs> to see more money from digital sales on the internet, but it's kind of more just like, get your music more out there, and then I'd like to go to those towns where people found it and are listening to it. Right. Meet those people and come out to the show. And then, yeah, I press vinyl records, and so those are the things that I'm like, this is what I'm selling. Mm -hmm. And the CDs are more, you know, promotion at times. I mean, you know, I sell CDs as well, but... It's know. really weird, people's approach to vinyl, because some people just swear up and down by it, and some people... Willie Nelson was on Howard Stern. He was like, I don't really care. Right. <laughs> you know, he was like, right. a CD's way easier. It's way yeah. better. You put it in, you know. It doesn't really scratch, as, you know, easily. And so it's just, it's, it's weird how vinyl is actually making a resurgence when the rest of the music industry is, like, kind of tanking. <laughs> right. right. So, do you... Uh, Will you put all your stuff out on vinyl? Do you think for the rest of your life? I go back and forth. You know, we're putting this... It is way more expensive, too. So much more expensive. Uh, you know, I actually, like, talked to the record-pressing plant, or one of them, today on the phone, you know, and I'm, like, getting this process going for this new record, and I've gone back and forth with this one just because it's... it's I save all this money and put out the record, and then that's, like, pretty much all my money. <laughs> so it's, like... Okay, now I have to like tour and get rid of this record to make this money back. Um, but, you know, I mean, I just, I was in Columbia this past weekend and bought, you know, four records. And I mean, right before you came, I was listening to this Doug Sum record. And he, I feel like more so than a CD, you put on a vinyl record and it, it has an ambience of its own. Each one, like, 
just gives off this vibe that's unique and maybe not every music listener gets that but I know I do mm-hmm. um, and I'm not I mean you can see all my records out there I'm not a huge record collector because I just don't like accumulating too much stuff mm-hmm. um, but there's just something about it and I like the idea that maybe one day some some kid's gonna find it in a thrift store and that makes me really happy right you know as opposed to a CD like God knows. Who knows? Those would go in the trash way before some of right. the records. I think it's cool because, like, if you look at sort of the history of the way people listen to music, vinyls always stuck around. Where mm-hmm. you know, CD. I think the CD format will eventually just be gone altogether, and it'll just be the USB or go on your phone. Right. And do you when you're mastering stuff? Do you think about oh, it's going to sound better on a phone this way, so I'm going to mix it this way. No. No? <laughs> no, I just try to get it, you know, I mean, through the mixing process, I listen to, I don't know, I guess, yeah, I listen on my phone through my iPhone a little bit, I guess, but through d- different mediums, and just try to find the most consistent, good sound for the mixing, and then send it to the mastering with fingers crossed, and... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, hope it comes back with the best, and, um, yeah, I mean, I'm just also just not that tech savvy or have that good of an ear in the sense, too, of, like, this is what phones and this, this, and this, so it's all a learning process. How do you find people that you trust with your music? How do you just do... With mastering, or... No, just in general, recording you, or, you know, do you trust only a few people, or do you, are you willing to, like take a chance at somebody that somebody recommends. Right. Um, I definitely take a chance. I definitely put my ear to the ground. Some people in town approached me about recording um, my next my next my next stuff and they put out tapes. Mm-hmm. And they're like, you know, if you're really happy with it, you know, we'd be stoked if you want to put it on a vinyl and I'm kind of like, well, if we're going to do it, I'm going to make it sound as good as we could, and right. hopefully it would. And, uh, I mean, these are people, I mean, one's a friend, and then the, the main audio engineer, I've never met the guy, and I'm kind of like, yeah, I'll take a chance, you know, because if it doesn't go well, so long as I'm not investing too much money, I can always re-record it. Right, so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, this last record recorded with Mike Martin, and met him through Bob Reuter's memorial show, and mm-hmm. he had recorded all of Bob's stuff in the 90s and early 2000s and he was in his band Kamikaze Cowboy and I was like the sound of that stuff and so when I met him and we hung out in the studio I was just kind of like this would be cool like almost all these songs were written in St. Louis since I've moved back um, all the musicians live in St. Louis and it'd be really cool to do it right in South City mm-hmm. as opposed to the last well in 45 we went to Belleville and then last two records are in uh, Columbia, Missouri, and so it's just kind of, kind of whatever fits best with timing, too. Have you ever just, like, scrapped, you know, some recordings, or very, just because, like, oh, this guy's a dick, or, you know, or... <laughs> no, not yet. Yeah. Uh, not yet. I would imagine, I, you know, down the road, maybe, um, but, no, I, I'm intentional enough that, like... You know. Yeah. You, know, you can usually tell within seconds if you like a studio. Right. You know. um, I mean, sometimes the mixing process, it, it gets nerve-wracking. It's like, oh, man, this isn't going to turn out like I hoped. And mm-hmm. then, you know, it's just kind of like, got to speak up. If this doesn't sound right, we have to keep tweaking it until it sounds right to my ear. Right. Um, but it's also, I have only limited time, limited money. Uh, they only have limited time. My band only has limited time, so... It's not like we're some like rock stars and this is all that we do. Right. We go in the studio for three months and write two albums right then and there. So how did you uh, put your band together? Uh, it's been a process. Uh, yeah, I lived in Columbia, Missouri for years when I met you and was traveling for a few and kept Columbia base and then it started kind of becoming Columbia and St. Louis and I met Big Money Records crew, Chris Barasevic, Ryan Koenig, and I had all these songs, and I wanted 
to record a new album, but this time I wanted to bring in all these musicians and had the idea of like making it this session of getting it loose. And from that, we kind of stayed a band, this big kind of thing for a while, and I kind of just kept shrinking it down. And people kind of came and left, and it came to the five of us now. And I've been really stoked about that. And I feel like the past six months, like it's like we're a band. Right. Cool. <laughs> yeah, there's part, there's a moment with the band you're like, you come to the self realization where it's not hard anymore. You yeah. know, everything's just like boom. Yeah. And that's when you're doing your best shit. Yeah. So, it's a good feeling for sure. Totally. What, um, what sort of influences, like, who do you draw from the most? You say, you know, or who do you steal your ideas from in terms of like, you know, is it, do you, do you even like listen to like, punk music or jazz and then uh -huh. try to take some ideas and bring it to your world or do you, right. you know who would you say your main influences are in your writing and your style I, I jump around a little bit um, you know consistently when I turn on Towns Van Zandt it's just like some like you know sonic like overwhelmingness of influence inspiration and heartache that feels so good at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, yeah, I, going out to punk shows and stuff can really inspire me, and I can take something from bands, and the same with listening to jazz bands and just, like, instrumentation and execution on things. Uh, but I, you know, I like songwriters, and we're just really into a lot of the 70s Texas stuff, and, like, late 60s Bakersfield stuff so I mean for the full band I really think about Buck Owens a lot Merle Haggard but then with my songwriting yeah like Towns Van Zandt and uh, I really like Jim Dillon Gilmore and the Flatlanders um lately I've been listening to Doug Som we get more into like southwestern country kind of almost like border music um and so yeah it's kind of kind of all over the board I mean also just my friends you know my mm -hmm. That sometimes gets me more than anything. Somebody I know and I know their story and know what exactly what they're singing about and they put it in the words beautifully. It's yeah. Like, wow. Like cool. That emotional sort of connection. Uh, it draws like so. It means so much. I was just, like I was listening to Dave Grohl talk about a record, and he was like, "There's a story behind this record, and lots of people know the story. These songs mean so much more to them." Right. And if you just put it in, just listen to it. Totally. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's true too, just like, somehow some local bands sometimes are popular in their own town, but like people don't get it from other towns. Mm -hmm. And I think it's sometimes that people just knowing those people and understanding their art more um, by knowing them, you know? Um, sometimes it's just a, a communal thing. It's not just the songwriter, the painter, or the band. It's everybody around them in the community sometimes that makes it what it is. And if you're, you know, complete outsider to it, sometimes people don't, don't necessarily understand it. Mm -hmm. There's something to be said about that, so not to be said. But, yeah. What do you think the differences are between the Columbia and St. Louis community? Uh, Columbia is just tight-knit, I mean, everything's so <clears throat> accessible, you know, where everything's at, I mean, it's hard to, like, like, when we had the hair hole in Columbia, the DIY space, I mean, it was not that long until people that we didn't know knew about it, because it wasn't that big, but St. Louis is so many pockets, and a little bit of everything is what I tell people, and in some circles just really don't overlap here. Yeah. Um, but it's also not that big of a city, too, that it's not that hard to find out what's going on, but there's still endless musicians in this town that I don't know. There really is, and I mean, it's it's weird, like, KDX seems, KDHX seems to tie most of it together right. pretty well, but you'll go, even if you went to St. Charles, you're like, what's going on here? This is a completely different scene, and, you know, even if you go further out to some of the more winery things, you're like, 
dudes are doing pretty well out here, and nobody right. knows who they are, and they're right. just playing covers, and, you know, it's just it's sort of this weird, uh, I don't know if I would call it hidden gem, but there are so many musicians here that are way more talented at that I think people realize. Yeah. And it's because it's cheap to live here, and you can actually gig a lot and play out a lot. Um, now, making the money here and the notoriety, that's totally Right. You know, it's you. I was talking to one guy, and he's like, I think some of the members of Wilco are originally from St. Louis, mm -hmm. but they say they're from Chicago. Mm -hmm. And he's like, St. Louis needs all the rock stars and get. You know, um, like obviously we had Pookie Lafarge come out in the past couple of years. Uh -huh. Other than like Story of the Year and Nelly, um, I don't know. I don't. I can't really. I really recall anybody else that's like, yeah, I'm from St. Louis, and there's a couple people that were born in St. Louis right. that, you know, now tour the world, but they're not like, yeah, I'm from St. Louis. Right. So, I don't know, it's this weird city where it's like, there's a ton of talent, but it goes a little unnoticed sometimes, and why, why do you think that, do you think it's just because we're stuck in the Midwest, or do you think it's just, we're not big enough, or? Uh, that's most of the country, from my experience, you know, um, it, it's only really those, like, few cities that, where everybody moves to, that then it's where the business is, you know, like, playing country music, um, and learning the business slowly, so much of the business does go through Nashville, mm -hmm. whether or not those bands or artists go to Nashville, but maybe if they have a manager, that's where their manager works out of, or that's where they go to record, or that's, you know, where this big convention goes on that all this networking, and, you know, if you play psychedelic music or something, Chicago or the Northwest, you know, like Seattle or Portland are big hubs and stuff, and, uh, you know, it's, I feel like most of the country is like St. Louis in the sense of, yeah, what, what, what's come out of there? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know, but then it's like you go to New York City, and then you like, yeah, these bands, and you're like, oh, wait, you're from St. Louis? You're from St. Louis? Yeah. Oh, but you guys are from New York. New York, yeah. So. It's kind of cooler to say, oh, I'm from New York, or I'm from L.A., <laughs> you know? And some people do. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> I, I think it is. So, you know, it's just, it's just weird. I mean, what? People ask me, it's like, oh, you play music, and you know, why didn't you move to New York or LA? And it's like, I don't think you understand. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to pay a thousand dollars to play a gig and pay a thousand dollars to live in a shoebox. Yeah. So is that sort of why you haven't ventured out, or just you know, you, from traveling the world, you just know it. I mean, it's pretty good here. So why would you move, or it, have you thought about it, or? Yeah, I mean, I've. Yeah, I went from high school to Columbia, and then from there, like, traveled around and came back to St. Louis, I and mean, my family's here, and got to know it more and more, and really learned the charm of it by coming back in glimpses and seeing the rest of the country, and really learned what is, like, so great and unique about it, and how much history and soul there is to it that made me, and made me still, like, extremely proud. Um, you know, I, I spent jaunts in New York City, and I love it there, but it was just like, man, I have to be, like, hustling all the time, and, like, um, the Northwest is beautiful, but, like, a lot of those places, it's just oversaturated. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it's, uh, I don't know, not as many, and, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love those places. I pretty much like everywhere I go. Right. But... <coughs> I, w I want to go to a place that, I don't know, I can do my thing and, I don't know, have genuine conversation or genuine interactions and, and stuff and less, less schmoozing. You know, a lot, a lot of times those places it's like, it's yeah, bullshit, you're bullshit, net networking, you know? and pushing just to be on people that yeah. sometimes don't want it. And All kinds of stuff. I mean, people, yeah. I don't know, St. Louis is just, it's an honest, authentic city. Mm-hmm. And, and it's true. not a ton of transplants, you know, most, oh, yeah, most people here are from here. Yeah, I mean, here for a long time. if you play the same clubs 
But even if you gig out a lot in St. Louis, I'd say within two years, you'll know virtually almost everybody in sort of like a tight-knit circle. Like, it, you know, you'll know who someone like Tommy Holleran is. You'll right. know, you know Susie Q or Cree Rider or Ryan Scriven just because, you know, they're doing stuff for the radio station, they're doing stuff for clubs. And right. So it's, it's pretty, it's almost... In a weird way, it's almost easier to live in a city like this because people get to know you a little bit better. Right. Do you, uh, do you ever pay attention to sort of the, oh, I guess the pop music industry at all, or does that really affect you at all, or, you know, uh, is what, mean, like, Kesh is doing, or, you know, do you analyze that and you're like, oh, how could I turn this into my marketing strategy, or is it just sort of a different sort of world? And yeah, just a different world. I like cut it out of my life so long ago. Yeah. That, like that, like I don't even know like what's going on. I remember like being with my mom. There's some like magazine cover, and I was like, "Who are these boys?" And she like looked at me and for whatever brothers like, came out. <laughs> yeah, like, brothers or yeah. No. Mumford and Sons. No, 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 no. Like big time pop music. Oh, like, Jonas Brothers. Jonas Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, you don't know who the Jonas Brothers are, and I was like, no. No. <laughs> I, so I, I'm totally like out of that world. So no, I don't really pull anything from it. You know, I get a, I get a kick out of it when I do hear it sometimes, or like see it occasionally, you know, like when I like watch TV here and there or something. But uh, nah, <laughs> it's just really fake and it's really polished to a point where it's, you know, it's almost like when you're eating a food that is like a sort of like a mass produced thing, and you're like tastes good, but I don't know, there's no, like, there's nothing natural about this. <laughs> I don't know. That's how it feels to my ears, at least. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, there's something to be said, I don't know. I remember talking to this guy named Mike Hood in, in New Orleans, he plays at, like, the oldest piano bar, and cool. he's kind of a rock star around there. But I was talking to him about American Idol and how much I didn't like it, and he's like, yeah, but there's something to be learned from it. And I was like, yeah, you're right. You know, there is something to be learned about, you know, all these weird, it's almost like to become, I don't know, a music star, it's like you have to get on one of these TV shows and sign your life away right. for almost the rest of your life. Like some of these reality contracts, like they own your image in perpetuity. Right. Which means forever. So they own your image forever, which that doesn't seem fair, yeah. right? So, but I, I think there is maybe a little bit to be learned from. Maybe not a lot. So I, I don't know. It's, it's a weird... I think the music industry is going through a weird phase where it's so fractured, there's not a lot of people to fight for the rights of even mid-level range guy anymore. Right. You know, the big big stars will always get, you know, a lawyer to take shit down off YouTube that isn't supposed to be there. But, you know, for just a random Joe like you or I, nothing's to stop, like, you know, like a big bad wolf who wants to trample over us. And, right. You know, now, I think it will change eventually uh, because of the movie industry. It has lobbyists and it has a ton of money, mm -hmm. so I think this like this, this almost like stealing of music and art will eventually stop. I don't know when it will, but I think it will, and then I think you'll see some of the music industry come back, where people actually have to pay for music again. And I think when people pay for music now, it's definitely more because they want to support the people who are doing it rather than, right. you know, they're like, here, here's ten bucks, and I want you to keep doing it, yeah. rather than like, um, I want to buy your CD for twenty bucks, because right. that was, you know, when I was growing up, I remember buying, like, a Beastie Boys cassette for twenty bucks, Whoa. you know, and, <laughs> and that was like the height of the music industry, is like, uh -huh. sort of raping and pillaging of the masses, and that's sort of why Napster was created, Right. but... I think one day it'll come back. It's just in a really weird place right now. Maybe it'll never come back. I don't know. Yeah. So, do, do you ever think about, you know, 
what you would do one day if people just expect all their music to be free? I mean, do you think people just drop out of it, or is, do you think it would be uh, just too people, hard? Or? People wouldn't drop out of it. I mean, just playing in the DIY scene and punk and stuff for so long, that, I think that's like a prime example of people being like, I don't do this necessarily to make money. Mm -hmm. I do this because this is like a celebration or an expression or just like something that I have to, or just distraction, like something that like, yeah, you know, like I, I work, you know, six days a week or whatever, or don't work at all, you know, and th this is what I do in my free time, I have fun, you know, with my friends, or, I don't know, I mean, you were, you were I, I emailed a DJ the other day, um, it was like a roots country DJ out of Cincinnati, and he like hit me up and was like, yeah, I want to, you know, I want to buy this, and I was like, oh man, I like, I'll send that to you, you know, like, you're gonna play it, and he's like, no, I buy my music from the artist, I want to support it, and I was just like, right on, cool, thanks man, like, appreciate that, mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, and also, I mean, the first, not, not to bring it all back to vinyl or anything, but the company that I've gone through pressing records before, uh, has doubled their wait time, because their business has increased so much, that more and more people are pressing vinyl, that now I had to go to a different different business, like more like a mom and pop business, wow. because the wait was four months, and oh, like, shit. in my mind, it was like two months is pretty much standard, you know, I got, you know, I got to dot my eyes, and I was like, kind of had a freak out, I was like, oh my god, <laughs> what am I going to do, so, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what happens, but live music also is just something that will never go away, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't make music just so I can record it and I make it so I can play it. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, do you try to record stuff and put it on YouTube or, I think what's really weird is like there's almost this, I don't know what I would call it, but it's a person, they sit down in front of a webcam and then they play a song. Right. And some people get a lot of attention from it. Uh -huh. Most of them don't. Right. Uh, seems like the people that do really well is the people that make like a, a really catchy video or a really smart video. Uh -huh. Have you tried to do any of that or? I haven't. Um, videos is one thing I haven't really delved into at all. I'm kind of just like been like people film the live, that's what happens, it goes on YouTube, cool. But more and more I've realized it's important to have if people specifically booking folks are going to take you seriously, you need at least one or two high quality videos. Right. So actually this past weekend we did like an intentional like live video, you know, not like a classic MTV music video, but just us playing live, somebody else recording the audio, and then it's all going to be cut and stuff and be just like a, a clean quality. Mm -hmm. um, I talked to this, this girl that used to go to Blueberry Hill, and she was like, I won't even, I won't even listen to people's CDs. Right. Because it's, you know, the, the modern world, you can make anything that's coming pretty good. Right. Um, she's like, so if you don't have a good live video, it's like next. Right. So that's, I think, uh, uh, pretty important. But then it's like, you're a musician, not a film director. Right. So how do you, it's like, how do you parry this skill and then you just need help from your friends, I think. Yeah. You know, and there's people to do it that won't do it. But it is sort of interesting how, you know, now it's like now everyone needs a YouTube presence. Right. You know, and it's like now people are trying to get hits on their YouTube website so they can do advertising and now it's like musicians went from being, you know, this person who plays music for money mm -hmm. to trying to be these like advertisers right or these you know not even products that you'd want to support on YouTube and so I can see why some people would have like the complete rejection of like this girl I played with Jane she was just like this she just didn't want to be a part of the world you know right. and she was like I would rather make music on my own and for myself than be a part of this sort of superficial world that we need to you know gain Facebook likes and Instagram followers 
there's some people who are really good at it, like um, Wayne Cohen of the Flaming Lips. Uh -huh. If you just follow his Instagram or his Twitter, you're just like, this dude has like a tap on the pulse yep. of the industry right now. You know, and he's even, it's like, it's even just weird the people who he chooses to be friends with as like a celebrity, or uh -huh. like Kesha, Miley Cyrus. And like, that dude's not dumb, you know, that dude's yeah. marketing himself. Right. As sort of a, as sort of a musician, how do you, how do you market yourself to others? Do you think about how to push yourself on the masses through like Instagram or Facebook or? <laughs> I, I mean, I was talking to Tommy Haller and he's like, yeah, I do two hours of social networking a day. You know, and he's like, he sets up, he sets two hours a day where he just sits at a computer and his emails to clubs, Facebook. Stuff like that. Yeah. Do you do that, or is it is um, that a different world for you that you kind of choose not to be a part of, or is it? I'm learning it. You know, I didn't like when I was like just me and my guitar playing, like mainly just busking, and I would play some gigs mainly just in Colombia. Uh, one of the owners was like, "Hey, like I get it. You don't want a Facebook page. I get it, but you need it." Like. If you want to play my club, pretty much you gotta at least have a, a Facebook link so I can post it, you know. And kind of after that, around then, I guess I was putting on an album and I was kind of like, okay. And so I learned slowly, you know, I, I paid attention to like what posts do, do better. You know, I've learned uh, posting a photo does better than a video, it seems like. Unless maybe it's a video of yourself, mm -hmm. then maybe that will probably do better. But um, yeah, I'm learning. I'm not on Instagram, thinking about it. You know, I got this new record coming out. I'm trying to, I'm trying to up my game. You know, mm -hmm. I'd like to be doing this more full time, and um, I don't really take that many photos though, really. <laughs> right. So it's like, what to do with Instagram? You know, I don't have that much to say, day to day or whatever with Twitter, but. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're trying to be a successful artist in any capacity, you have to have some kind of thing that people can latch on to in a way, whether it's just some kind of, like, branding style that you don't even have to use in the social network, but something that, like, people can recognize anywhere. Um, it's, it's hard because it's, like, you start off and you're like, I just want to play guitar and write songs and have people appreciate it not be this like jack of all trades sort of like now I have to design my own website it's like oh, I'm not really good at that or now I have to like market myself it's like uh, that's not my skill set you know and so it does get pretty tough pretty quickly but I think it's one of those things you're just you're forced to learn it and you just have to totally. like you'll get to that conversation at the point where yourself with a club owner they'll be like dude I'm trying to promote you you don't have a Facebook account everyone has Facebook what uh so this new record what uh tell me about it is it different is it not different um, different from the yeah, past yeah how, i mean is it an evolution or is it more yeah, the same or definitely an evolution uh it's definitely like i said before i have like a band now it's been like the five of us and you know a few times like somebody could make it with a film or something but almost all of this are songs that are written for the band that we've been performing people have written you know melodic parts and stuff and played those fairly consistently that we went in there as a band and made this record so the one before like I said it was more of a brought in a bunch of musicians and it was kind of like this song would be cool for this this would be cool for that and we just kind of practiced a few times and did it. This one, we've been playing the songs out, you know, at shows for some of them a year, some of them, you know, a week. You're right. Know. Are, they, um, are they live takes? Or are they track recording? Yeah, we went in and did it all live. Um, you know, there's some overdubs. We redid a few solos. And then we brought in extra musicians, extra vocalists, mm -hmm. um, you know, to add some sugar and spice to it. Um, That's cool, because I think... Track recording is really easy, especially when you have like a 
sort of the ways that knows what he's doing and can right. cut and paste and uh, but I think like recording live definitely adds this like level of emotionality that you just never get. You never right. get those like sort of happy accidents when you listen to the record. Right. And you're like, oh, you know, like let oh, if you listen to a Led Zeppelin record, it's all over the place. Uh -huh. I mean, you can listen to those songs like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times and just be like, oh wait, that that he, he kind of like hit his pick really weird on the you know uh -huh. the strain. You know, never oh, yeah. noticed that before. So. That's really cool. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's like if you're burning time in the studio, you got to be really, really careful. So, I mean, it's so easy to go into the studio and just bomb. Right. So, um, I'm sure you're at a point now where I don't think you probably worry about that. Uh, no, I still do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm comfortable enough that, like, I know it'll, I can you know, can perform, and I know it's not going to be a total shit show, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as you progress and progress with the band, you know more and more what you want, and know what you're capable of, so that, when it's like, you know, third party's like, yeah, no, it sounds good, and you're like, well, actually, we normally play a lot better than that, so no, I'm not going to use that take or something, um, but, yeah, you know, you, you got to be comfortable, you got to be confident. I like consistency, you know, being able to show up, play, and, you know, have it sound right just about every time. How do you handle, like, a live show where you think you bomb, so, like, you eat you up, or do you just move on quickly, or is it... Uh, it, used, it, it used to really bother me, and, I mean, it, it still can, um, but... more and more like people typically don't notice you know a lot of times the crowd's never heard you before and so like a little hiccups here and there that like really will eat at you while you're playing to the crowd they didn't even hear and we played a show not that long ago that the whole set was a little weird but it was fun and you know it's all about having a good time too and so we were having fun up there which was the most important thing and we got to the last song and we were like 20 seconds in and the band just like fell apart and it was like not an intro like we were in it maybe 30 seconds in and that's kind of something that I'm just like well, what you the know, fuck do we do you don't stop a song and I mean you know I laughed about it and let's do it again and then we nailed it and like I was like afterwards I was like yeah you know and people were complimenting the set and I was like yeah except the last song and somebody was like no it was perfect like it grabbed the audience's attention like the people that mm -hmm. were halfway listening were kind of what just happened, and then we go right back into it, and then they're like, oh, cool. So, it's almost weird, like, people have such a limited attention span, it's like, yeah. you know, if you're playing perfectly, no one's gonna care, but... I like rawness. I, I don't like stuff to be 100% polished, it's boring. Yeah. You know, like, I, I, I like grit, and, uh... I had a conversation with, like, an old lady the other day, and she was like, you know what I hate is going to a show and being exactly like on the CD, and, like, this was, like, a complete music, like, philistine, like, you know, she didn't, you know, yeah. but I was like, you're fucking right, like, yeah. you know, you go to a show and you're like, it's cool, and, like, sometimes you're like, you know, you really like these people, and you're like, wow, this is, like, boring shit, yeah. and it's the most boring, you know, stuff you could ever see, and that's a point of a lot of people's live shows that miss something, it's because it's just, it's just music being played, and that's cool and all, we need this extra level to like really kick it into gear where people go like, wow, that, you yeah. know, uh, it could be the lyrics, it could be like the lead guitar player is fucking amazing, it could be, you know, a unique singing style, but it's just, people I want to go out there and be impressed, you know, yeah. they're not, you know, especially they can sit on YouTube and find anything they want nowadays, so yeah. it's like, I think there's a, there's a Dylan line from one of his songs that's like, you know, what else can you show me? Yeah. You know, and that's sort of it's like true. I mean, they're looking for something new. You know. Yeah, I mean, you know, come back to like the video thing and internet, I mean, you're just going click away from that's your only chance with some people or some booker and you know, with YouTube and stuff, you know, like 
how often do you really watch, or even when like albums are up on YouTube and it's like one track at a time, like how often do you listen to a whole song sometimes? Yeah. Like, everything's right there, click away. Usually never. Same with iPods, same with Spotify, you know, iTunes, all, even CDs, you know, like just like, nah, this is okay, boom, next, ne next song, next CD, you know. One thing that is really cool about it is when they click on you, it's actually because they chose to click on you. Right. Rather than like, in a bar, sometimes people are like, they don't choose to hear you, you know, they're just right. there and hear that it just happened. So that is the cool thing about it, where it's like, if you have, you know, 2,000 views, it's like, it's really because 2,000 people chose to click on it. Right. So that is the one really, really cool thing about it, is you have a, you know, you can see right there, you have a temperature gauge, you shit, you know, and it's, it's weird, sometimes you'll put stuff on YouTube and for whatever reason it'll have like 700 views in a day, mm -hmm. you're like, and sometimes that's just because of the title, you know, yep. I put like a, one of my paintings online, it was like Dylan in Nashville Skyline, and it was like, it had all these views, and I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, the, the painting was titled after people were probably looking for the album, right. and I'm just like, oh wait, you know, and do you think about how, you know, little things like that can sort of just change everything, you know, do you, or do you obsess over, like, the title of songs, or, you know? Nah, you know? titles of songs, I mean, I try to, you know, put a tiny bit of thought into it of, like, how will this come across, like, I'm looking at, but I'm, I'm just kind of, like, typically just pull it from the hook, you know, and don't, I don't, I don't, like, have some philosophical title that you don't hear anywhere in the song, like, 99% of my song titles is something that's in the song, if not even the, the hook of the song. But do, do you have a, an overlying message to your material, or are you, are you just trying to tell stories? Mostly? Yeah, it's, it's more just my journal, you know, it's just, it's my personal stories is on the road, home, love, heartache, you know, good times, bad. Um, other people I meet, um, just more, yeah, I just try to write an honest song that, like, people can relate to, um, and hope that most of them, it's pretty obvious what's going on, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes, you know, you get a little bit weirder, and it isn't right there in front of somebody, yeah. know exactly, like, what the story is behind it, but, no, nah, I'm not trying to, like, preach or sell anybody anything, I'm, I'm, it's just not, not really who I am, I guess, in a way, so I'm just kind of more, it's, it's my journal, you know, I don't, I don't have a journal, it's just something that happens to me that really affects me or something, in right. some good or bad way, a lot of times that's what comes out in the song. How do you uh, like approach the guitar, like when you pick it up and try to write a song, do you really think about, like, oh, this is the theory behind it, or just feel like you have, like, sort of melody in your head and try to get put it out, do that? It's all different, song by song. At this point, a lot of times I'll try to be, like, on the last few are kind of an E, so I'm going to stay away from that key this time. But, um, and other times the, the song is a melody, sometimes I'll have guitar part that then sparks the song and then I write words to that as opposed to having words and finding how they fit, you know, mixed down with the guitar and singing. So it's different each time. And also, just try to keep it simple, you know, uh, I think Woody Guthrie said for playing more than three chords are showing off, <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like, you know, we just kind of keep it semi-blues progression, you know, and Basic. Do you think there'll ever be a day where you sort of jump out of the country genre at all, or...? Yeah. Um, I feel like I've expanded with that, and still am, and evolving, and... Yeah, like I said, I see myself as a songwriter before a country artist, so... What do you think <coughs> of today's country music? Do you think it's just bullshit, or do you think there's some good stuff? The mainstream country. Right. I mean, I just laugh at it. I think it's 
just outrageous and I'm, I'm, I'm not one of those people that's like super angry about it or anything like that because it's just it's just pop music it's yeah. just blended in with the rest of the pop it's weird it's like yeah you li- I listen to it sometimes just to be like wow this song all sounds uh-huh. literally the same and I don't know the ideas are just these like really it's like these really catchy one liners yeah you know, I remember listening to a song a couple years ago. It was country guy. It's like you make my speakers go boom, boom. Yeah. You know, and it's just like, what? <laughs> I don't know. It's like, how do people enjoy this? And you know, it's like one of the number one songs for a little bit. You know, it's just, it's just weird. I don't know. But I, I, I don't know. I think music's always sort of been not like the real musicians, and then the sort of pop stars, but there's always been like a bubblegum side of music. They'll always be very strong for whatever reason. Uh-huh. And I think today it's more pronounced because there are no like small independent record label, or not as many, you know, where you send your artists on the road and they come back and yeah, yeah you know, everyone makes money and now it's like, are you going to make a million dollars or, you know, are you going to make $300 million? Yeah. Lady Gaga put her in that album and it's like it had 200,000 units sold in the first week and it was an epic failure uh-huh. you know <laughs> and it's yeah. like one of those things it's like it's all relative you know totally so why don't you play a song and sure. kind of talk about it for a little bit sure um, so yeah I guess I'll play this tune it's on the new record, uh, it's on Lee Ann sing, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Um, what kind of guitar or is that? This is just a Taylor guitar I bought it used when I was like 18. And, uh, yeah. Does it, does it mean a lot to you or? Uh, I mean, yes, but I, I you know, I'm not, I'm not like, uh, I'm not a gearhead or like a, a guitar guy. Um, and I like, you know, I don't have a name for my guitar. Mm-hmm. A friend of mine's son the other day was like, you know, you gotta name your guitar. It's a girl or a boy, and I was like, oh, it's not that bad. Like, it's an androgynous alien. <laughs> yeah. I mean, somebody dropped it a few years ago and put a big crack in it, you know, I got duct tape on it, you know, like, will I get another guitar one day? Yeah, of course. I'll get a, a nicer one in mm-hmm. better shape, but for now, this, this fits, it works. Mm-hmm. Um, Season tune. Yeah, it stays in tune pretty good. I think I need to change the strings at this point, which I'm also real slow and bad about. I never like changing my strings. <coughs> I don't know. I'm just like one of those people that's like when they break and they're done. That's how I am. But after doing this video thing this last weekend, and we did it outside, I'm sweating a lot. Oh, yeah. So right before we came in, I was playing and I was like, wow, this thing is like real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really ruined it. But what's weird is like the St. Louis humidity. And the cold, like, will just ruin your set. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, you can be playing outside for a gig and it'd be like 95% humidity and it'll just be like, this sucks because you're like tuning like every three seconds and, yeah. you know, there's all these like bum notes everywhere. I remember playing in Newtown when it was like freezing cold at this place called Beatnecks. Uh-huh. And it was like literally right by the door and every time someone walked in, it was like my guitar would go out of tune. Oh, okay. <laughs> so like by the middle of the song, it was just like, uh, I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> so, yeah, well, um, how did you write this song? So this is one that was one of those ones that somebody said a line to me, and I was on my way out west, and I put it in my phone, like, uh, in my notepad. So mm-hmm. it was kind of one that I sat on for a while, and at the time I had a bunch of ideas and was kind of working, you know, working on one at a time and we are putting out the record and I needed, you know, at the time we had nine songs and I wanted it to be a shorter, precise record um, and so it was the last song I wrote, well I guess I wrote one, one, I guess I wrote during it and kind of passed it up. This ended up being the final song written for the record and uh, yeah, just kind of a... Uh, true love story kind of thing, um, stretching the truth 
uh, combining two different, one thing I like to do a lot with like kind of love and romance songs is combining both perspectives into one perspective to make it a little more interesting and just kind of more material to sing about. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a traveling kind of heartache kind of song. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> What's it called? Uh, Santa Fe. I was calling it just like Santa Fe, but I think I might just call it Santa Fe. What was the line that you had? It was just like Santa Fe. Oh, just like Santa Fe. And that might have even been all over again. It's just I think it was it was just like Santa Fe all over again about me leaving. And uh, I was kind of like, sometimes you have gotten a lot of texts. Sometimes that I'm like <laughs> they try and like to like think of a good song because mm-hmm. like that. I, I can hear it already. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. So, it wrote itself. Yeah. It, cool. This one took a minute. And this was one that I didn't... I, I was like, ah, it's, it's okay. It would be good. Another song on the album. And then some friends of mine were kind of like... You got it. That's the favorite song I've written, you've written in a while. I'm like, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. I've had so many people that I've done this <clears throat> uh, podcast always say that. You know? They literally say... the. Thing that song they think is the worst is people's favorite. You know, yeah. that's to deal with people's self consciousness, or if it's, uh, you know, if it's just sort of one of these weird things, which, you know, the material that I think musicians spend so much time thinking about something that it's like when you're not thinking, that's when you're at your best. So, right. anyway, cool. It's just like Tim Yeah. Just like Santa Fe All over again And I didn't stay You didn't win I left you high And long to cry Places to play off Broadway. It is, yeah. yeah. It seems like you always do really well when you play there. 
it's it, it's a fun place to play. I, I really like the room, and I really like just the people that run it. They they do it right, and they're cool and down to earth with the musicians. And uh, yeah, it's a good place. Cool. And you know, the sound's always really good there. Too. It sounds great. Yeah. yeah. And they bring in a lot of cool bands. A lot, a lot of roots music and country goes through there, but they don't limit them so much to that either. So. Yeah, it's one of those places too, which is like, it's not a, uh, not a lot of foot traffic, so you kind of have to bring. You yeah. Have to really make your work hard to make your own show there. Yeah. So if you pack the room, it's like, dude, you knock it out of the right. park because. Which is hard, hard to do. It's you know? really hard to do. It's a gamble if people are gonna come out. Especially if the weather's whatever, you yeah. know, it could be too nice, it could be too <laughs> shitty, you know, it's yeah. gotta be like just right, yeah. and then just right now to you. I was talking to some other people about how a lot of clubs in St. Louis kind of like expect the music, musicians to bring the people in, right? you know, versus like kind of how unfair <laughs> that is in a weird way, yeah. and it's like... Wait a minute, man, this is your bar, you're supposed to have people here, and I'm supposed to be like the cherry on top of everything. And, right. You know, do you, have you ever sort of had issues with club owners, or like, you didn't bring enough people, or... Oh, yeah, I mean, I've played so many shows where I don't, I don't get paid because the, the house fee is all that was made or wasn't even made or something. Right. Um, you know, talking to older friends of mine that play music, I mean... Yeah, it used to be the opposite back in the day, that it was 100% for the club, or there'd be promoters working for them that would, that was their job, and the band's job was just to show up and play. Um, today, you know, it, it, it's unfortunate that it's changed, but I, th I think it's cool when both work together, you know, and like both do their part, mm -hmm. and I think that's fair, you know, like, it makes sense. I mean, there's more and more bands all the time, used to not be like that and so it makes sense that like you have to do some like work to get people out yeah I was talking to a guy who set up my guitar and he's like he hasn't played music you know since the 60s and you know he's like this guy he's, he, he's gonna offer us a hundred bucks to play you know for three hours or something and he's uh -huh. like I got paid a hundred dollars in the 70s right <laughs> so he's like thanks but no thanks sort of thing right. So that's also another sort of roadblock, I think, uh, for the modern musician faces that a lot of clubs don't have music anymore because I talked to a girl starting her own bar, I'm like, hey, you gotta have live music, and she's like, well, and honestly, like, turns away as many people as it brings in, huh. which is like, I think it's kind of true sometimes, but I think it's also people being lazy and not booking the right people. Right. Their joint. So, in a weird way, it's like anybody can record, you know, songs on their phone now, yeah. and present them, and you know, try to gig. And I mean, it's totally possible. But like back in the day, you need to be like really tight, really good. And if you wanted right. to press a record, it was more difficult. You to match. Yeah. yeah, you have to, you know, from the singer to the bass player, you know, everybody on down has to. I'll go into a studio and I won't even be that practiced, well practiced on the song, you know, just because I know, you know, I can, I'm just doing it part by part, it doesn't, you know, which is cool because I don't, you don't need to put a ton of effort into something to make it sound good, and uh -huh. like on the other hand, it's like, is this being watered down, or, right. you know, how much do you practice? I should practice more. Um, <coughs> Even in this one bedroom, uh, I, I play a lot more. I now, like, have more alone time, and will like see my guitar in the corner and be like, I, I, "All right, I have to play these songs." Um, and I typically just really practice songs that are brand new or that I'm writing, um, and then occasionally like a new cover or something. Um, and then with the band, I've tried so hard to get one one day a week with the band. Mm -hmm. Trying to be it's pretty really tough. It's so tough. I mean, everybody's so busy, but you know, we do alright with that. Um, so it's tough because like all the musicians usually have these like gypsy lifestyles of like, yeah, I work you know weekends or I work you know this and you know, trying to coordinate. It just gets pretty. And people are busy, and then people start having kids, and then that is like this new you know dynamic. Oh yeah. To stop 
high at certain times, though. Yeah, it's definitely hard. It's, I think it's it's the coolest time to be a musician, and it's also the hardest time to be a musician. Yeah. In a weird way, you know, there's a lot of open doors and there's a lot of shut doors, and you know, I think sort of getting to the top of the mountain is a little bit di more difficult than oh, yeah. it used to be. So, uh, just sort of like one more question. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask it, but the beard. <laughs> How long has it been since I uh, shaved or you saw it? You, you know. Uh, also, it, what does it sort of represent? You know, or is it just your look or? You know? I, I, it's, I mean, I think it you know started out probably just out of curiosity a long time ago. Um, I haven't shaved it clean in years. Yeah, I'm not saying it's a bad look. You know? Yeah, yeah. God knows I have a lot of hair too. So. Yeah, um, you know, it's just kind of more of a. <laughs> Thing that kind of happens, it grows fast, and I, I'm not the type that like grooms myself a lot, you mm -hmm. know, or anything. I wear the same clothes all the time, so it doesn't really make sense for me to be like tidying up my face all the time. Um, I think it's also like you know Jack really immediately, like you know, you can see him from across the room, <laughs> you know, it's like and that's unintentional. <coughs> and that That's one thing that I've, I've, I've dug myself into a hole because uh. People, it's one thing that strangers will come up and talk to me about it, which gets old real fast. Mm -hmm. And then it's one of those things that when I do trim it down, or even the last time I like shaved clean, my friends don't recognize they freak me. Freak out. <laughs> yeah, they don't recognize me, you know. So it's 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 one of those kind of things and like wow shit. So yeah, it is just kind of one of those things. It is what it is, you know. Right. The same as like having long hair. Or something. Right. It's yeah. Kind it's of like oh, it's. Eventually, just kind of happened, you know. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's one of those things where I think some people think those things are more um, convoluted than they really are. Right. You know, they're like reading. I think when you watch somebody, there's a tendency to really judge them pretty hard and oh, yeah. sort of unfairly. Oh yeah. You know, but I think it's sort of everyone's natural tendencies to do, but. So it's so easy when you have a giant beard and you're like, oh, that guy, he's just, he's just growing it because, you know, yeah. I don't know for you know, whatever reason. Right, right. But, I don't know. It's just who they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, that's great, man. Well, thanks for doing this. Yeah. I appreciate you taking the time with me. Absolutely. So that was awesome. Yeah. All right. Cool.